This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Whether you love true crime or comedy, celebrity interviews or news, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue. And guess what? Now you can call them on your auto insurance too with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. It works just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance and they'll show you coverage options that fit your budget. Get your quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Over the past few weeks, you might have noticed some very public hand-wringing about artificial intelligence. A lot of it from people who had made AI their life's work. The so-called godfather of AI is warning that an end to humanity is a real risk. And he's just quit his job at Google to warn us. We need to think really hard now about how we're going to control something that's more intelligent than us. That's Jeffrey Hinton, an AI pioneer who's been on a bit of a media tour worrying about AI since he left Google. But it's not just him. There was a public letter from Elon Musk and others calling for a pause in AI development. An essay in Time from theorist Eliezer Yudkowsky saying generative AI, the kind of tech that includes chat GPT, can harm humanity or even end it. Suddenly, AI doomerism feels like it's everywhere. And as I've watched these warnings spread, there was one person I really wanted to talk to. My name is Meredith Whitaker, and I am the president of Signal. Meredith is also the co-founder of the AI Now Institute at NYU and was one of the organizers of the 2018 Google Walkout. I wanted to know what she thought when she heard Jeffrey Hinton's worries about AI. One of my reactions was that it felt a bit disingenuous, not that I don't believe that he has concerns and not that I don't believe that, you know, our concerns in some ways overlap, right? It's, you know, in some sense, it's positive to have people coming out and raising the alarm because there really are risks related to AI. But Meredith sees those risks somewhat differently. And, you know, the risks that I see related to AI are that, you know, only a handful of corporations in the world have the resources to create these large-scale AI systems. And corporations are driven by interests of profit and growth, not necessarily the public good. And when you have these you know, powerful tools in their hand, we you know, should expect to see them serving those interests and not necessarily the public good. And I think that the concerns that were raised by Jeff and others are, you know, I would say, less substantiated by evidence and often looking at hypothetical future scenarios in which these you know, statistical systems somehow become hyper-intelligent. And I don't see any evidence backing those claims. And I, it's not that I don't believe people are sincere in these beliefs. What I am concerned about is that the sort of look over here into the vast future is playing into the hands of the corporations we need to be worried about right now. Today on the show, what's the real threat of AI? Could it really kill us all? Or are the risks a bit closer to Earth? I'm Lizzie O'Leary, and you're listening to What Next TBD, a show about technology, power, and how the future will be determined by humans or robots. Stick around. Here at Planet Money, we bring complex economic ideas down to earth. We find weird, fun, interesting stories that explain the way money shapes our lives. Inflation, recessions, the price of gas, we've got you. Listen now to the Planet Money podcast from NPR. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card, the credit card created by Apple. It gives you unlimited daily cash back that you can now choose to grow in a high-yield savings account at 4.15% annual percentage yield. That's more than 10 times higher than the national average savings rate. Apply for Apple Card now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start growing your daily cash with savings today. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility requirements. 
savings accounts provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Member FDIC, national average savings rate is from FDIC website, term supply. As the president of Signal, the encrypted messaging platform, Meredith spends a lot of time focused on privacy and the inner workings of the web. When she worked at Google, she founded the company's open research group. And she's also a founder of MLab, an open source platform that measures internet performance. This is a long way of saying that she thinks about the internet and machine learning a lot. She doesn't particularly like the term AI. She prefers ML, machine learning. We used to call AI machine learning because AI is basically a marketing term that glorifies these technologies and machine learning was like, you know, where the hype was focused at that moment. That moment being 2013, 2014, when she saw what she calls the first round of AI hype at Google. What I realized and what really alarmed me then and continues to alarm me is that these, you know, what we're calling machine learning or artificial intelligence is basically statistical systems that make predictions based on large amounts of data. So in the case of the companies we're talking about, we're talking about data that was gathered through surveillance or some variant of the surveillance business model that is then used to train these systems that are then being claimed to be sort of intelligent or capable of making significant decisions that shape our lives and opportunities. You know, even though this data is often very flimsy. The data that feeds these systems is from all over the web, gathered by crawling millions of websites. And it's everything from news sites to hate speech. And it is being sort of wrapped up into these machine learning models that are then being used in very sensitive ways with very little accountability, almost no testing, and backed by extremely exaggerated claims that are effectively marketing for the companies that stand to profit for them. You you also work with the AI Now Institute. And, and I think something that is important to note is a, a line from them, from you, I guess, that says, nothing about artificial intelligence is inevitable. And I guess that feels like it runs counter to the, to a lot of the prevailing current sentiment where, you know, I opened up my inbox this morning and I had four different PR pitches that included the, the term AI. I, I wonder if you could expand on that a little bit. This, this idea that nothing is inevitable about this. You know, I think we have to recognize that the tech industry as it is, is very, very recent. Most of us old millennials have some living memories from before the internet was what it was. Certainly before we had mobile phones that were part of our, our sort of prosthetic brains, right? So this has happened really, really quickly. I don't think we need to accept it as inevitable. I think it's very historically contingent. And I think, you know, in general, part of the narrative of inevitability has been built through a kind of sleight of hand that for many years has conflated the products that are being created by these corporations. So email, blogging, search with scientific progress. And Hmm. the message implicitly or explicitly has been, do not put your finger on the scales of progress. Don't regulate it. Don't question it. Don't voice concerns about it because if you do that you're going to be sort of you know messing with you know kind of the arc of science the evolution of human knowledge whatever the kind of grandiose framing is instead let the technologist do the technology you do what you do and we'll all benefit from you know progress being made um, by these companies and i think you know for a long time that staved off regulation, that intimidated people who didn't have computer science degrees because they didn't want to look stupid. And frankly, that led us in in a large part to where we are, where we are in a world where private corporations, who in some ways have more power than states, have huge dossiers, unfathomably complex and, and detailed dossiers about billions and billions of people and increasingly provide the infrastructures for our social and economic institutions, whether that be providing so-called AI models that are outsourcing decision-making, or whether that be providing cloud support that is ultimately placing incredibly sensitive information, again, in the 
hands of a handful of corporations that are centralizing these functions with very little transparency and almost no accountability. So I think, you know, that is not an inevitable situation. That's a situation we know who the actors are. We know where they live. We have some sense of what interventions could be uh, could be healthy for moving the situation we're in towards something that is more supportive of the public good. What do you make of this moment then where on the one hand, you have a number of consumer facing generative AI products, chat GPT, Dolly, Stable Diffusion, et cetera, circulating among the general public. And at the same time, people who are, you know, to some degree, eminent pioneers in working with neural nets or or large language models saying, hey, maybe this stuff was a mistake. Like, why are those two things happening at the same time? So if you think about sort of past AI milestones, you know, in quotes, we can think about something like AlphaGo when DeepMind's AI beat the complex game of Go and, you know, there were the headlines sort of changed the rules, AI is advancing, et cetera. But there's a real sense in which we have kind of had to trust that, right? An expert says be- beating Go is a, an, a significant step in AI. We can kind of rationally understand that and we're trusting that, you know, this really is a, a milestone moving forward. ChatGPT, in a sense, gave us each sort of a, a window into the fact that, yes, these, these systems are astoundingly quick and pretty good at producing plausibly shaped responses in, to prompts, right? And I think, in part, that fueled a larger public conversation where people were sort of asking questions about this, where there was a lot of hype. You know, people were kind of able to, you know, Rorschach like project all sorts of human and, and, inhuman qualities onto these systems because they were sort of simulating an interaction that we're all so deeply wired to respond to. So I think, I think in part that there is a a real moment where if we didn't want to anthropomorphize these systems, which again, there's no evidence they're they're sentient, there's no evidence for a spark of consciousness, but it actually takes a bit of resistance to not anthropomorphize them because Hmm. the interaction we are performing with them is one we are primarily familiar with having with, you know, real human beings. The same responses in us are being triggered by this mega chat bot that are triggered by texting with a friend. And so I think I think there's something fairly deep to be examined about the, you know, the, the human responses that are being played on by these systems, you know, particularly chat GPT. Um, and then, you know, the way that provoked a, a kind of crescendo of speculation around you know future risks and you know concern that was largely centered on this you know this this ill-defined anthropomorphized version of artificial intelligence that is in my view rooted more in that you know human reaction than it is in any evidence that the data and servers and human labor required to create these systems is ever going to itself become sentient. Humans are obviously sentient when they contribute this labor, but you know, insofar as those are all the ingredients that are required to create and maintain these systems, that combination in itself is not a sentient being that has been brought into the world by, you know, superhuman Dr. Frankenstein's. Well, where, where is a better place then, do you think, to put that focus? If it's not on having these sort of Dr. Frankenstein feelings, is it thinking about the data that is going into large language models and, and the biases that can come along with that data? Like, you know, you said you didn't dismiss Hinton's concerns out of hand, so I'm, I'm wondering where your concerns lie, if they lie in a slightly different place. There are many concerns we have to hold at once. This isn't a zero-sum game. And of course, you know, data bias and the fact that these systems will be shaped like the you know, data they are informed by is, is a big one, right? And, and Natasha Tiku at the Washington Post did a really brilliant exposition looking at you know, what actually goes in to creating ChatGPT, right? Yeah. Where does it learn how to predict the next word in a sentence based on how many billions of sentences it's been shown? Where does that come from, right? And it, it showed some gnarly things like neo-Nazi content is in there, deeply misogynist content, you know, and, and, you know, gnarly and not surprising because we all know the internet, right? And that's where this comes from. That comes from sort of 
you know, platforms and, and surveillance that has been enabled by the commercialization of, of the internet. Data is a big concern. And, you know, again, going back to what we were talking about with, with Measurement Lab and the subjectivity of data, who gets to author data, right? Who gets to determine what it means and how is that shaping, you know, an implicit worldview that is then sort of parroted back through these AI systems? I think, you know, for me, there's a, there's a big concern also about just who gets to use these systems, who benefits from them and who is harmed by them. Because they require so much expensive computing power and, and so much data. I mean, that sort of automatically says they, they can only exist in the hands of, of either very wealthy corporations or very wealthy individuals. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what is the business model for that, right? So, you know, I, I want to I point to something that's giving me a lot of hope right now, which is the Writers Guild of America strike. Hmm. And the Writers Guild of America are striking because their working conditions have been degraded pretty significantly over the last number of years. And one of the demands that they are making on the studios is that they want the control to decide whether AI is used at all in their creative process, and if so, how. Now, that is a really powerful form of what I would call kind of you know regulation from below. That is just you know you know kind of joining together in the you know, classic labor organizing and saying you know we're not going to work until we have working conditions that support us and sustain us. And part of that is pushing back on the use of these technologies by studio heads and others who want to, you know, extract more from us by and while paying us less and saying, no, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to allow that technology to be used as a pretext for degrading our skill and our work. Meredith argues that having generative AI out in the world now is less about you and me getting to do cool things with ChatGPT and more about big companies' bottom lines. It costs billions of dollars to create and maintain these systems head to tail. And there isn't a business model in simply, you know, making ChatGPT available for everyone equally, right? ChatGPT is an advertisement for Microsoft. It's an advertisement that is telling folks like the studio heads, like the military, like others who might want to actually license this technology, you know, via Microsoft's cloud services, hey, this, you know, look, this works. This can do interesting, neat things as long as you don't care about the veracity of the content. Um, and hey, you should sign up for, you know, a license, right? So we already know who's going to be able to actually use this ultimately, who the business model will target. And it's not technology distributed democratically that the entrepreneurs and the people with a, with a good grind set will be able to apply. It is going to follow the current matrix of inequality in our world as it is shaped now. When we come back, the Skynet question. From Pod Save America co-host John Favreau comes Crooked Media's weekly series, Offline with John Favreau. Each week, Offline explores the worlds of news, politics, entertainment, sports, and business to better understand all the ways our extremely online existence is shaping the ways we live, work, and interact with one another. Catch new episodes of Offline with Jon Favreau every Sunday. Listen on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. The inner workings of the internet are fascinating, from fiber optic cables to servers, routers, middleware, and all the physical interconnections. But where do you find the all-important human layer in that tech stack? The award-winning TraceRoute podcast is back with its second season to answer that question with some of the most insightful and brilliant technologists of our time. The TraceRoute podcast is a tech podcast unlike any you've heard. This season features new co-hosts and new stories about the inner workings of the digital world. Each episode of the TraceRoute podcast will peel back layers of the stack to find the stories about hardware's very real effect on human lives. Where are the traces of humanity in the digital world? How do hardware connections lead to human connections? Have we become detached from the tech that supports our daily lives? What happens when you make tech so accessible and easy that everyone can create something? 
Listen and subscribe to the new season of the Trace Route podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Check out the Trace Route podcast now. I'm Gideon Litchfield. I'm the editor in chief of Wired. And I'm Lauren Good. I'm a senior writer at Wired. We're making a new show. It's called Have a Nice Future. Have a nice future. <laughs> I like the way you say it. I'm more have a nice future, question mark. It's a show that is honest about how unsettling the future can be. It's exciting. It's a little scary. But the message that we want to leave you with is that it is okay to be uncomfortable. And this is an interview show, which means we're going to be bringing on the people shaping this future, the top technologists and thinkers and creators who we talk to all the time for our jobs. We're going to ask them about living in this uncomfortable world, about the big challenges we face, about the challenges they're creating, the solutions they're proposing, and how they deal with living in perpetual uncertainty, as we all do. So make sure you follow Have a Nice Future wherever you get your podcasts. I want to talk about what I have seen as, I guess, maybe a, a bifurcation of the the criticism of, of generative AI that seems to be popping up. On the one hand, I feel like you have Hinton, Yudkowsky, et cetera, saying like there is an existential threat here. And on the other, people like Tim Negebru, Deb Raji, Joy Bolamwini, perhaps you, saying the, the issue here is as much in how these things are built and trained as anything else. And yet, I I, I saw Jeff Hinton call your concerns less existential uh, in a CNN interview. And I I wonder what you make of that, because it it seems like there are sort of these two different camps in, in thinking about how these models are disseminated into the wild and what kind of harms they might do. Yeah, I think I think that is more or less correct. Um, and within those camps, of course, there are many small differences and people seriously wrestling with analysis and, and trying to really get our heads around something that is extremely complex that needs to take account of the political economy. You know, who is who's controlling these and how are they likely to be used? The construction of the technologies themselves, what data do they use? How are they trained? What does that tell us about what their capabilities and harms will be? And then, you know, a set that I would say is is focused on sort of theoretical, hypothetical, long-term risks, which, you know, is the, you know, existential risk is often used to mean the risk of eliminating all of humanity. The, the Skynet. Yeah, the Skynet risk, right? And even if I recall the movies correctly, like there were still humans where Skynet was. So is that existential? I don't know, right? Like what? It was not great for those humans. Yeah, no, it it looks pretty dark. Um, You know, nonetheless, like what do we mean by existential becomes kind of the the crux of this argument. And my my concern with some of the arguments that are so-called existential, the, the most existential, is that they are implicitly arguing that we need to wait until the people who are most privileged now, who are not threatened currently, are in fact threatened before we consider a risk big enough to care about, right? Because right now, low-wage workers, people who are historically marginalized, you know, Black people, women, disabled people, et cetera, those people in, in countries that are on the cusp of climate catastrophe, you know, many, many folks are at risk, right? Their existence, you know, the term existential means something like, you know, concerned with existence. Their existence is threatened or otherwise shaped and harmed by the deployment of these systems. And we can look at these systems used in, you know, law enforcement. You know, there's a a New York Times story from a few months back about a man who was imprisoned based on a false facial recognition match, right? Like that is deeply existential for that person's life. That person was Black, and we know that these systems, people like Deb, Joy, Tim Neat, have documented over and over again that these systems are more likely to misrepresent Black, misrecognize Black people, and in a world where Black people are more criminalized and there is inequality in law enforcement, that that is, you know, that is going to have harms, right? So my concern is that if we wait for an existential threat that also includes the most privileged person in the entire world, we are implicitly saying, you know, maybe not out loud, but 
the structure of that argument is that the threats to people who are minoritized and harmed now don't matter until they matter for that most privileged person in the world. And I think that is, that's another way of kind of sitting on our hands while these harms play out. That is my core concern with the focus on this sort of long term instead of the focus on the short term. So, so then what is the, what is the next step? Is it shut it all down? The next step are, in my view, things like the Writers Guild of America winning, showing that we can put clear guardrails on the use of these systems. And those guardrails don't have to come from in treating those who already have power. They can actually come from, you know, power building in workplaces and in communities. I think we also have some interesting proposals for, you know, more grounded regulation. I would look at Lena Khan's New York Times op-ed recently that calls for structural separation of these companies. I would also look to the really grounded proposals that Amba and Sarah at the AI Now Institute put out in their 2023 landscape report, particularly the proposal that looks at you know, privacy legislation as something that could, you know, be beneficial in stopping some of the data-centric AI development, right? Because of course we have to get back to this sort of kind of core reality that AI is built on surveillance. It is a product of the surveillance business model. It is in a sense, like one more way that these companies can make use of the data they created and collected, you know, in service of targeting ads. But now that can be in service of training AI models um, that expand their market reach and profitability. So AI entrenches this surveillance business model. I, I was going to ask you about that because th- th- I feel like this is a place where your your day job as president of Signal kind of meshes with this concern, right? We have started to see Reddit and others say, okay, if you're going to use our API to, to train your large language model, you got to pay for it. But then it makes me wonder... Okay, well, what happens to the data of a of a regular citizen? Like, how do you, how do you know if if your Reddit post or whatever any other piece of data um, is is being trained here? And are there ways to feel safer around that if you're concerned? The concerns that animate me at Signal and my concerns around AI they're inextricable. Right. And I see I took the job at Signal happily because I saw it as a way where I could protect this incredibly important core infrastructure for truly private communications in a world that is increasingly riddled with mass surveillance. And that that, you know, that Signal was proving that we could do tech outside of this surveillance business model, that it's actually a little safe haven from the indiscriminate collection and use of all of this data that you know does feed into the AI models that does feed into you know creating models of reality that affect our lives in ways that we often don't know and don't have control over so you know there is in a world where AI continues at the pace we're saying, seeing with the voracious appetite for data we are seeing privacy eroded you know, we can think of a kind of never ending story metaphor, right? And in a world where we see the model that Signal is is showing possible, that the model that Signal has created that is you know supporting millions and millions of people around the world to use technology in ways outside of the surveillance business model, we see privacy supported. And you know, my view is we see rights supported and we see a world that is that has a lot more potential to create livable conditions that benefit all. So I, you know, these these two things are very closely connected to me and that's why I'm here talking about them because I don't think we get to the world that I believe in and that I work for every day at Signal without naming you know, what is happening in the dominant tech industry and how dangerous it is to some of these core values. Where where is your hope for reining that in in a in a policy Realm. I mean, I know you have have worked with Lena Khan. You mentioned Lena Khan and the FTC. Do you see that coming from her, from that agency? Because I certainly don't see Congress doing anything. It, it is complicated. I think you know. I was heartened to see her op-ed, and I am also watching intently on some of the the things that are happening in Europe around the AI Act. 
I guess when I talk about the policy realm, I think we can't see legislation, regulation, policymaking as disconnected from the rest of it, right? We know that these companies spend hundreds of millions of dollars lobbying. We know that they spend a lot of money supporting astroturf organizations that will sort of, they can proxy their views through. We know that in, a, in the U.S., in a post-Citizens United world, it is very hard to get elected without a huge amount of money, and that money can be ultimately secretly contributed, right? So we're in an ecosystem where policy doesn't just like bring de novo from Zeus's forehead and... It's not Athena. Yeah, right. It is not Athena. It is not, you know, it's not made based on a kind of dispassionate examination of ideas, right? There's a huge amount of influence that goes into shaping policy. And there are folks like Lena, there are folks who are, you know, really taking taking this seriously, but that doesn't mean there aren't fierce counter pressures. The point I'm making here is that I think, you know, we still need that fierce counter pressure. We need people on the ground saying, no, we don't want facial recognition in our community. We need people lobbying for privacy. We need, you know, the, the California privacy law to be kind of proven and to set the benchmark. We need, you know, we need all of these things at once to make it ultimately more painful for those with the power to make regulation and policy to not check the unaccountable development and deployment of these technologies than it is to check them. We have to recognize that we have a lot of competition in applying that pressure. So how do you want someone like my mother, you know, smart person, doesn't know that much about this stuff, to, to think about what feels like a, a sea of AI headlines around them these days? Well, I think to know that they're not alone in being overwhelmed, you know, it's really confusing. There are so many claims in the headlines about what these things do and don't do. And I think if there's one thing I would say, just, you know, keep an eye on who benefits and who is likely to be harmed, right? When you see a headline about open AI, you need to always recognize that that's talking about Microsoft. When you see a headline that's about AI, you need to remember that there are only a handful of, of entities in the world. These are corporations based in China or the US that have the resources to make AI. And to remember that AI is not magic. It is based on concentrated resources, concentrated computational power, concentrated data resources that are generated via surveillance and the sort of concentrated power of these companies. Again, we know where they live. We know where their data centers are. And it is eminently possible to you know, put these technologies in check if there's a will. So you know, it's not out of control. It is not out of our hands. And you don't have to be a computer scientist to be able to you know, have an informed opinion about how these are used, who gets to use them, and to what end. Meredith Whitaker, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Meredith Whitaker is the president of Signal. And that is it for our show today. What Next TBD is produced by Evan Campbell. Our show is edited by Jonathan Fisher. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio for Slate. TBD is part of the larger What Next family. And TBD is also part of Future Tense, a partnership of Slate, Arizona State University, and New America. And if you're a fan of the show, I have a request for you. Become a Slate Plus member. Just head on over to slate.com slash whatnextplus to sign up. All right, we'll be back on Sunday with another episode. I'm Lizzie O'Leary. Thanks for listening. <laughs>